What's up, Falcons Nation, NFL fans? It's your boy, Jew, coming at you guys with another edition of What's the Word, Dirty Bird. We do this every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And I hope all is going well with you guys. Uh, but today I do want to talk about a quarterback, Matt Ryan, and why Matt Ryan will be a Hall of Famer. And we also will get into um, your questions. If you guys have questions, as we know, the NFL draft um, is about a week away. Uh, so I know you guys are going to, you know, ask your questions and things of that nature about the draft as well. But I want to go ahead and give Matt Ryan his flowers. Um, a couple weeks ago, he did come out stating um, basically that he will be retiring um, in the next couple weeks or the next couple months um, and calling it a career. But I did want to take uh, today's What's the Word Dirty Bird to give Matt Ryan his flowers because I really feel like I've been seeing a lot of different things on social media. Um, about Matt Ryan and they're comparing him to guys like Philip Rivers and, you know, asking the question, is Matt Ryan a future Hall of Famer? And to me, Matt Ryan is a lot to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, no question to me that he possibly could be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I think he should be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But I definitely want to take uh, today's What's the Word to give Matt Ryan his flowers uh, for everything that he did in his NFL career. Uh, not only for the Atlanta Falcons, just for what he did for the game of football. Uh, as you guys come in, uh, please hit that like button for your boy. Uh, please share this content out. I really appreciate each uh, each and every one of you guys. And before I move any further, I do want to wish my youngest brother a uh, happy birthday. Um, shouts out to my bro, uh, VA. Uh, today is his birthday. He turned 32 today. So shouts out to him. Wishing him a happy birthday another Aries in my family. So shouts out to baby bro. Um, but with that being said, as I mentioned to me, when, when it comes to Matt Ryan, we know that Matt Ryan uh, was the greatest Atlanta Falcons quarterback and arguably the greatest uh, Falcons player in Atlanta Falcons history, but definitely unquestioned the best quarterback of our franchise history. Yeah, we've had guys uh, like the Barkowskis. We had guys like Michael Vick. In our past, we had guys like Chris Chandler, but to me, it's unquestioned just off of um, accolades alone. Matt Ryan pretty much blows every other quarterback uh, that we've had uh, out the water uh, pretty much. But I do want to um, jump into the chat really quick and just uh, say what's up to Miss Sonia Howell. I appreciate you joining me. And if you're in the chat, definitely I would thank you guys for joining me. Please hit that like, hit that subscribe button for your boy. Um, and I know this was kind of like a pop-up show, but you guys can expect me uh, to go live pretty much every Tuesday unless I post it that I'm not going live. Uh, Sherman Wood said, what's good, family? What's going on, man? I appreciate you jumping in as well. But I do want to give, uh, you know, some of Matt Ryan's accolades um, because, like I said, to me, he's easy, uh, easily – a Hall of Fame player, a guy that should easily get into the Hall of Fame and should be, a, to me, a first ballot Hall of Famer. But if he's not first ballot, he definitely unquestioned should be in the Hall of Fame. But as you guys know, Matt Ryan is a four time uh, pro bowler, um, one time first team all pro with our Atlanta Falcons, uh, won the rookie of the year um, with our Atlanta Falcons, um, also was the MVP in 2016 of the whole NFL. And also, um, Matt Ryan, I believe, is top 10 uh, all time as well in passing yards. He has over about 62,000 passing yards in his career, to be exact, 62,792 uh, passing yards in his career, which makes him a top 10 passer all time in NFL history. So to me, it's, it's definitely like a no brainer. Um, I've been seeing a lot of different things where they're comparing him to guys like Phillip Rivers. And to me, it's nothing against Philip uh, Rivers. I think Philip Rivers could possibly be one of those guys that uh, possibly gets in the Hall of Fame as well. But when I just looked at the, the list of top 10 um, passers in NFL history, pretty much every name that's um, in the top 20 as far as passing yards in NFL history, um, pretty much all of those guys are Hall of Famers. If you look at the list, of guys that are well matt ryan is let's see he's number seven in all-time passing yards in nfl history but if you just look at the top 
10 guys, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, uh, Peyton Manning, Brett Favre, Ben Roethlisberger, Phillip Rivers, Matt Ryan, Dan Marino, Aaron Rodgers, and Eli Manning. I think all of those guys get in uh, to the Hall of Fame just based off of their passing yards and accolades alone. Um, Eli Manning, we know he's a two-time champion. He's the only guy to me in this list. Him and Phillip Rivers are the two guys that I think are borderline Hall of Famers. But I believe that Eli Manning gets into the Hall of Fame just based off of him beating Tom Brady, who most consider the GOAT of all time as far as quarterbacks. Um, so being that he is 2-0 against Tom Brady and 2-0 in Super Bowls, I really feel like that's what uh, that's what puts um, Eli Manning in the actual conversation or puts him in, um, you know, the, the Hall of Fame. So I definitely think that it's, it's a no brainer when it comes to Matt Ryan, all of these different things that I'm seeing about, you know, should he be borderline or should he be in the Hall of Fame because he never won a Super Bowl? If you look at the guys that I just listed um, in that top 10, um, you know, Philip Rivers in the top 10 didn't win a Super Bowl. Dan Marino didn't win a Super Bowl. And then if you just look at like the top 20 guys, you got guys like Warren Moon, who's in the Hall of Fame, didn't win a Super Bowl. You got guys like Fran Tarkenton that's in the top uh, top 20 in all-time passing yards, who's a Hall of Famer. So if you just look at the list of guys, Dan Fouts, uh, he's 20th on the all-time passing list. To me, he's one of those guys uh, who was a part of those Chargers teams, but you know he didn't win any Super Bowls. So if you you just uh, look at majority of just the NFL in general, if you don't even just narrow it down to quarterbacks, as you just narrow it down to the all-time great players, I really feel like the media, um, you know, has jaded a lot of the fans. Is when it comes to if you haven't won a Super Bowl, you're not a great player or you're not a great quarterback. But if you look at the, you know, some of the top players in NFL history, a lot of the guys that are already Hall of Famers or guys that are going into the Hall of Fame, you know, this coming season, a lot of these guys weren't able to win a Super Bowl because a Super Bowl um, mainly is a team accomplishment. It's not a one man show. It's not a one man accomplishment. It takes a complete team to win a Super Bowl and winning Super Bowls is really, really hard to do. So just being able to get to a Super Bowl, and this is what, you know, me and Mike and Kay Styles we talked about last week or a couple of weeks ago, you know, if you look at the percentage of guys that are in the NFL currently playing, how many guys have even played in the Super Bowl, let alone won a Super Bowl? You know, I really feel like that's one of the hardest things to do. Winning an NFL championship is one of the hardest things to do. So as a player, but if you look at guys like, Randy Moss, who some consider, you know, the greatest wide receiver ever, or the second greatest wide receiver ever. If you look at guys like Terrell Owens, if you look at guys like, um, you know, Megatron when he was in the league, all of these guys were great talents, great players, um, borderline top five receivers of all time. And none of these guys have Super Bowls. But you have guys that are lesser talents that were on better teams that actually won Super Bowls. Uh, guys like Deion Branch, you know, that played with the Patriots. Pretty much a lot of those Patriots wide receivers are guys that probably won't be in the, the Hall of Fame, but they played a role in getting to the Super Bowl and winning those Super Bowls with Tom Brady. So it comes down to the bigger picture. And I really feel like, as Birdman says, we need to put some respect on Matt Ryan's name. You know, I feel like a lot of people disrespect Matt Ryan. And as a Falcons fan, just seeing what we've went through the last two to three seasons without Matt Ryan, it kind of just shows like how great Matt Ryan was, that he was one of those guys where you come into a season with him on your roster, he can win you, you know, three to five games just off of good decision making and him being able to have those fourth quarter comebacks. If you look at Matt Ryan's career, he's one of the better quarterbacks when it came down to, you know, game winning drives, when it comes down to the, crunch moments which we seen last year and the year before with Marcus Mariota and with Desmond Ritter you know those guys weren't able to close out games and that's the reason why we gave Matt Ryan the nickname Matty Ice is because he had like ice water in his veins when it came down to putting us in field goal range or being able to go down and score a game winning touchdown Matt Ryan was one of those guys that was fearless um, that could make every throw on the field 
and was one of those guys that was just one of the best in pressure situations. So I really feel like, you know, we need to give him his flowers. I really feel like he's one of those guys that goes under the radar because he played with the Atlanta Falcons, which is like a smaller market team. And because we never actually got over the hump and won a Super Bowl. So, you know, he played in the era where you had the Drew Breeses. You had guys like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, you know, as some people would call like the golden age of the quarterback. Matt Ryan was right there in the upper echelon, right there behind all of those guys, competing with those guys year in and year out. And I really feel like we definitely should give him his just due before it's all said and done. You know, I feel like a lot of the times as fans, you know, we don't appreciate a player until either they're dead and gone or we don't appreciate them until they're no longer playing for your franchise. And then your franchise kind of falls on hard times. And I really feel like a lot of those people that wanted Matt Ryan going are now realizing how special of a quarterback Matt Ryan was, a quarterback that had 10 straight seasons of passing for over 4,000 yards, you know, which doesn't go, you know, grow on trees. You know, we haven't had a 4,000 yard passer since Matt Ryan was in that, you know, with our Atlanta Falcons organization. So with that being said, I want to jump back into the chat, you know, and just um, jump into the chat and acknowledge some of you guys that have joined me since, you know, I started my little soliloquy and shouts out to Miss Pam, uh, Pam Johnson. What's going on, Miss Pam? Good morning. I appreciate you joining me. And she says, without a doubt, first ballot Hall of Fame. Yeah, I definitely think first ballot Hall of Famer for Matt Ryan. And what's going on to my bro? Uh, my bro, Mad Mike, in the chat. Uh, one third of the heavy hitters. Miss Christy Lewis says, hey, Jew, Falcons family, what's going on? I appreciate you joining me. <laughs> and Smooth C says, Jew, what's up, man? I appreciate you joining me. He says, working will catch the replay. Yeah, definitely catch the replay, man. I appreciate you joining. And Anthony White, what's going on, man? He says, Matt Ryan will be a Hall of Famer. Uh, he will be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, no, he won't. But I think his second or third time on the ballot, I think he will get in. And with his numbers, he deserves it. Yes, most definitely. I mean, I really don't care when he gets in, long as he gets in. But I feel like all these people that's questioning it, to me, it's it's no it's no um, debate. Like just based off his accolades and all of the things that he's done in his career, over his career, you know, being the rookie of the year, being a, a offensive player of the year, being an MVP of the entire league getting your team to the Super Bowl, you know, appearing in the Super Bowl, just those things alone, him having five straight winning seasons from the time of his rookie year until coming to Atlanta Falcon organization, having five consecutive winning seasons, which had never been done in Atlanta Falcons history. I think just from just those accolades that I named alone should make him a Hall of Famer. And what's up to Dre Murphy? He says, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing and feeling? on this nice, pretty, warm Tuesday morning. I hope all is well with you, Dre. We are, I'm doing great. I hope you're doing great as well. And Miss Pam says, Matt Ryan had a Super Bowl appearance with Tom Brady based on the 2016 MVP year. He will be first ballot. Yeah, I hope he's first ballot, but as long as he gets in, I think he deserves to be first ballot just off of all of the accolades that he has. I mean, I can't see a reason um, why, even though we know when it comes to a lot of these voters and things of that nature, guys that are nominating these guys um, to be in the Hall of Fame, you know, we've seen them make guys like Terrell Owens wait because they just didn't like his attitude and the way that he approached the media when he was playing. When we all knew that Terrell Owens should have been one of those guys that should have been a first ballot Hall of Famer. And that was one of the reasons why, you know, he decided not to go to Canton with all of the, you know, his his other all of the other players to kind of be nominated and to be, you know, put in the Hall of Fame. He decided to do it at his uh, university that he played college football at because he, he felt slighted, which I definitely think that, you know, he should have felt slighted because I definitely think that Terrell Owens should have been a guy that should have been, um, you know, a first ballot Hall of Famer. But at the end of the day, as I mentioned, I just want to give Matt Ryan his flowers. Um, I definitely think that he's one of those guys that should go down in the history books has already went down in the history books, just being a top 10 passer all time, him having a completion percentage of 65.9%, you know, passing 
uh, completion percentage. And I really feel like we probably won't see another Matt Ryan in our lifetime, probably um, possibly on our Atlanta Falcons roster, just the way that he went about his business. He was just a different type of player. So I really feel like he pretty much carried this Atlanta Falcons organization for most of his career. Early on, we had a strong running game, a pretty good offensive line and a, and a solid defense. But I would say probably after his first couple of years in the league, especially towards the back half of his, uh, you know, his career, we seen that Matt Ryan was the reason in 2016 why that Falcons team was able to get to the Super Bowl. You know, his decision making him being able to, you know, throw the ball and, you know, his his ability to lead the Atlanta Falcons team um, with that high powered you know, passing attack and high powered offense. So. With that being said, I want to say what's up, Miss Maggie T in the chat. I appreciate you joining as well. And you guys give me your thoughts, too, in the chat of Matt, uh, Matt Ryan. Do you think he should be a first ballot Hall of Famer? Do you think he'll get in the Hall of Fame? I think for most Falcons fans, it's a no brainer. But I've been seeing a lot of different stuff on Twitter where they're comparing him to different guys and kind of stating why he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame or that it's, it could be close on whether he gets in or not. And personally, I don't think it's close. When I look at his numbers and when I look at all the things that he's done in his career, I definitely don't think it's it's close at all. I think it's just, it's a no brainer. And Anthony says, uh, what's good, you? What's the word today? Yeah, today we just acknowledging Matt Ryan. You know what I'm saying? If if you guys have questions about, you know, Matt Ryan or just about the draft or anything that's upcoming, we can talk about that too. But the first half of the show, I just wanted to give Matt Ryan his flowers because I feel like a lot of people disrespect Matt Ryan and guys that really don't watch Atlanta Falcons games, you know, guys and gals that don't watch the Atlanta Falcons games or didn't follow his career. I think, you know, Matt Ryan has always been one of those guys that kind of was in the shadows. People really didn't get to see him on the big stage until we were in the Super Bowl. And then I really feel like because that 28 to 3 loss, that kind of tried to paint a, you know, a black mark on, you know, Matt Ryan's name because on the biggest moment we had that 28 to 3, which that to me doesn't fall on Matt Ryan. If you go look at his numbers in that Super Bowl, was one of the best Super Bowl performances for uh, from a quarterback standpoint. So we all have seen, you know, Kyle Shanahan in the last two Super Bowls that the 49ers have played in, them blow fourth quarter lead. So it kind of has been seen in broad daylight that we know the reason why the Atlanta Falcons are not Super Bowl champions, why we didn't win in 2016. And majority of it falls on, you know, falls at the feet of, Dan Quinn falls at the feet of Kyle Shanahan and the coaching staff for not, you know, closing out that game the correct way. And I agree with Miss Pam here. She says working with CBS as an analyst will help his exposure. I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I definitely think that that'll help him, even though Matt Ryan was always one of those guys that was a community guy. He was one of those guys that was, you know, always did things right in the community did things right around the league. So I really don't feel like any of the voters necessarily from the most part, I don't think will have it out for Matt Ryan because he wasn't one of those guys that was tough on the media. But I know that because the Falcons are a small market, they kind of try to avoid putting Falcons players in the uh, in the Hall of Fame. If you look at, you know, guys like Jesse Tuggle, who to me is like a no brainer, should be in the Hall of Fame. He also appeared in the Super Bowl with the 98 team. But one of those guys that played for a really long time and was one of those guys that led the league multiple seasons and tackles as a linebacker. To me, he's one of those guys that should have been in the Hall of Fame, but he kind of got slighted just for the mere fact that the Falcons are, were not a team that had that spotlight on them. They're not the Cowboys. They're not uh, the Green Bay Packers and kind of the blue bloods of the, the NFL. You know, the teams that they kind of prop up, you know, the Raiders, the teams that the Steelers. The teams that everybody, you know, grew up on, the, the Falcons are one of those teams that was kind of blackballed by the league at one point and really don't get the exposure uh, that we deserve, to be honest. And Anthony said it uh, best, right? He said, I don't think so, Ms. Pam. Uh, uh, does he deserve to be a first ballot? Yes. But like you said, it's a popularity contest. He won't get in first ballot. Yeah, I don't know who, if he'll get in or not. But I do think that it is a popularity contest and sometimes it, it kind of it works out 
and plays out that way where it's guys that should definitely be in should be no brainers. Sometimes they don't get in because they were on a smaller market team or they won on one of those teams where they were being propped up. Like I said, like the Cowboys, like the Packers, like the teams that everybody always likes to talk about. And let's see here. And Miss Pam also mentioned uh, Tommy Nobis is one. Yeah, he definitely should be in. Both her and Anthony mentions Tommy Nobis, uh, the former linebacker of the Falcons. Yeah, he definitely would be one of those guys as well, even though I didn't get to see him play. You know, I heard that he was one of the better guys, um, you know, in his career that played with the Atlanta Falcons organization um, way back in, I believe, like the, the 60s and 70s. So I agree. I definitely think that he's a guy that should have been in. And Dre says, me personally, I think Matty Ice should be a first ballot Hall of Famer, point blank period, end of discussion. Most definitely. Yeah, I agree with you. I think he definitely should get in. I definitely think that, like I said, it's a no-brainer. When it, when you look at the numbers that he put up, when you look at the guys, the teams that he beat, if you just look at the Super Bowl uh, year alone, that year um, to get to the Super Bowl, I believe we beat the Seahawks in the divisional round, which is Russell Wilson and that Legion of Boom team, which I think a lot of those guys will be Hall of Famers. Richard Sherman, uh, I think Russell Wilson will be a Hall of Famer. Um, guys like Marshawn Lynch that was on that team, guys like Earl Thomas. And then if you look the next round, NFC Championship game, you go up against Aaron Rodgers, who will definitely be a Hall of Famer as well. And that team that he had with Jordy Nelson and those guys. And then you get to the Super Bowl, and you go up against Tom Brady, who's arguably everybody's GOAT in, you know, the in the conversation to be the GOAT of all time quarterbacks. And you are up 28 to three against him. So I really feel like it's not a way to really um, diminish that Super Bowl run. If you go look at Matt Ryan's numbers in that Super Bowl run, it was one of the best, you know, playoff runs and one of the best seasons. Just statistically, that Falcons team, I believe if I'm not mistaken, was like a top five offense of all time as far as points and yards they put up. They were right up there with the greatest show on turf, um, that 99, you know, 2000 Rams team. So which everybody considers probably the greatest offense of all time. So that Falcons team, you know, to me was one of my favorite all time teams. When I compare, um, you know, the teams that we've had in the past, the 2016 team, arguably is my favorite team It's 2016 and 2012. Those are the two teams that I really remember as my favorite teams, but probably that 2016 team had all of my favorite, you know, favorite all time Falcons, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, um, you know, Devontae Freeman, uh, Coleman coming out of the backfield. You had Muhammad Sanu on that roster. You had Taylor Gabriel, now, that team was just loaded with a bunch of different players. Then you had on the defensive side of the ball, Grady Jarrett, Deion Jones, all of these guys at their height and the peaks of their power. Guys like Keanu Neal, who was a rookie but played really well in that season. You know, you had the Robert Alfers. You had the uh, Vic Beasley's, you know, playing at the top of his game. You had the White Freeney on that roster, Jonathan Babineau. The only player I'll say that on that roster that I wish was on that roster but he had retired a year early was Roddy White. To me, um, I think that that uh, 2012 team, if they would have gotten to the Super Bowl and beaten Colin Kaepernick in that, that game where we blew the lead in the NFC Championship game, where they should have called pass interference uh, against Navarro Bowman when Roddy White tried to catch the ball over the middle, um, I definitely think that that team would have beaten that Ravens team. No disrespect to the Baltimore Ravens and Ray Lewis and those guys. But I think if you put that uh, Falcons team with Matt Ryan, Michael Turner, um, you know, Roddy White, Julio Jones, Tony Gonzalez, that team was really, really, really good. And I don't really think that the Baltimore Ravens, I think they would have had a hard time uh, matching up with that 2012 uh, Falcons team as well. That team was really, really good as well. I think that the 2016 team defense may have been a little bit better because they had more depth. Because if you think about the 2012 team, you had guys like Jonathan Babineau still on that roster. You had, I believe at that time, Dunta Robinson, if I'm not mistaken, was one of the corners. You had Brent Grimes, who was didn't play in that uh, NFC Championship game. He was hurt. But you had guys like Sean Weatherspoon. You had guys like 
Steven Nicholas at the other linebacker position. Um, you had, I believe, uh, William Moore was on that team. So you had Willie Moe and Thomas Deku uh, on that roster. So I think if you look at top to bottom, I, I think that it probably would, I would say that the 2012 offense was right there with that 2016 offense. But I think the 2016 defense was better at getting takeaways and things of that nature. I think they were just a little bit better when it came to pass rush and stuff like that, because that 2016 team, that defensive line, and you guys know I'm huge on the defensive line. You had guys like Courtney Upshaw. You had guys, um, you know, like uh, Rasheed Hagerman. Um, you had Grady Jarrett. You had the white um, Freeney. You had Brooks Reed, who was a guy that would come off the, like, be the, on that second rotation of defense alignment. You had guys like Adrian Claiborne, who was another guy that was really good at like being a pass rush specialist that didn't play in that Super Bowl because he was injured. So that team, that 2016 team, I think was just one of the deepest rosters the Falcons have ever had, um, basically on offense and defense. And I think that they probably were the most complete uh, Atlanta Falcons team that we've seen. With that being said, I'm going to jump back into the chat and say what's up to you guys um, that's joined me recently. John Sinclair, what's going on, man? I appreciate you joining me this morning. And shouts out to Prince Kale, 89. What's going on, bro? I appreciate you joining as well. And let's see. And Blanco, what's going on? He says, Stat Ryan wasn't good enough for Hall of Fame. So you trolling. Man, go look at his numbers again, man. Matt Ryan is a top 10 all-time passer. So whether you want to call him Stat Ryan or whatever we want to call him, the guy's going to be a Hall of Famer. You're going to have to start calling him Hall of Fame Stat Ryan because <laughs> he's going to be in the Hall of Fame, man. When it's all said and done, I believe he's eligible in 2028 is what they're saying. If he doesn't ever play another snap in the league, 2028 is when he will be eligible. And I expect – uh Matt Ryan to definitely be in the uh, be in the uh, Hall of Fame at some point. And with that being said, you guys can start dropping your questions in the chat as well. Like I said, it don't just have to be about Matt Ryan. I just kind of wanted to take this time out to give Matt Ryan his flowers. As I mentioned, we a lot of times we wait to give players their flowers, but before he even gets into the Hall of Fame, before he even you know states what day he's going to retire, and I'm sure he probably will sound like a one day contract with the Atlanta Falcons so he can announce his retirement, you know, and do it the right way. But, you know, he did mention recently that in a couple of weeks, he expects to retire or a couple of months. He might, you know, make it official and put in those papers with the NFL that he's not looking to come back and that he want to officially retire. So before he even does any of that, I wanted to go ahead and get him in his flowers because to me, he was one of the, Definitely one of the greatest Falcons quarterbacks and one of the greatest quarterbacks just in general that I've ever seen play the game. One of the most fundamentally sound. When you hear him call the game, you know, call the Falcons game against the Saints last year in the last game of the season, he talked about the fundamentals of Desmond Ritter stepping into his throws. He talked about the small, intricate details, the things we talk about that makes quarterbacks special. That's what Matt Ryan had. He was one of those guys that was a technician when it came to footwork, when it came to, you know, from the neck up, being a guy that was really smart, knowing where to go with the football, knowing pre-snap, you know, where his hot reads were and things of that nature. That was one of the things that made Matt Ryan great. And he's just almost uh, draft time. Yeah, I definitely, uh, Yasuke, I definitely, um, you know, know that the, the draft is right around the corner, man. So if you guys have questions about the draft, y'all can drop that in as well. I just wanted to start off with talking about Matt Ryan because I know you guys are probably having draft overload. We talk, I talked about the draft the last two shows, but if you guys want to talk about the draft, we can definitely um, – I'll hit on the draft as well. Xavier Littman, what's going on, man? Y'all got to drop those questions, though, because if y'all don't drop them questions, y'all know where I'm going to start. I'm going to start talking about with the draft. It's going to start with Dallas Turner and Latu and, and Jared Verse and all of those guys. And shouts out uh, to Michael. What's going on, man? Good morning. I appreciate you joining me. But you guys go ahead and drop them questions in the uh, in the chat. What you guys, what's you guys' thoughts since we're a week away? We can get into some draft talk since we're a week away. You guys give me your thoughts on 
the NFL draft. Where y'all think we're going with the first round pick? You guys know I recently did my video where I talked about the Falcons taking uh, Dallas Turner. And personally, if I were the Falcons, it got to be one of those top three pass rushers. I'm not trading back. If Dallas Turner's there, if J uh, Jared Versus is there, if Layatu Latsu's there, I'm taking one of those guys. But personally, just looking at, you know, some of the stats that came out about guys dropping in the coverage and having linebackers that are flexible and looking at what Raheem Morris did with the L.A. Rams. I think that a case can be made for all three guys being drafted. But personally, I think that my prediction is that it's going to be Dallas Turner because he's a freak athlete. He's a guy that gives me Michael Parsons vibes. And I've said this from the start. He is one of those guys. His player comparison is actually Brian Burns is what the, you know, if you go to the NFL, you know, combine, if you go look at his numbers and look at what the scouts stated, their comparison for him is Brian Burns, which to me, Brian Burns is a really good player as well. So Michael Parsons, Brian Burns, to me, those guys are similar players that personally I see more uh, Michael Parsons than I see Brian Burns, because if you go look at a lot of, um, last night I went and looked at um, Michael Parsons, Penn State, some of his tape from Penn State. And one of the reasons why I was, you know, got off of the train of let's draft Michael Parsons is because I was convinced by the fans that Michael Parsons was going to be too little, that he was a linebacker. Why would he be an edge rusher in the league? He's too small. He's a off ball linebacker. And if you go look at most of Michael Parsons highlights, when he was in college at Penn State, 90% of the time he was actually playing linebacker. Like he was like a middle linebacker, inside linebacker. And he was just like blitzing, just coming off the, you know, the edge on blitzes, coming up the, you know, the the um, gut on blitzes where they would just bring him, where he would just come right up the, uh, the A gap and, you know, blitz and things of that nature. And he was just like a Tasmanian devil. And I see the same similar traits when I look at a guy and Dallas Turner. Dallas Turner isn't a complete, you know, player, but the things that I'm hearing coming out of, you know, Alabama from Nick Saban, um, talking about how hard of a worker he was, um, listening to guys like Will Anderson talking about last year before he was drafted that he felt like Dallas Turner coming into Alabama was like one of the most talented guys. He talked about Dallas Turner kind of having that baby weight when he first came in but that he was keeping up with everybody in the sprints and things of that nature. When they first met at Alabama, he talked about him being an upperclassman and Dallas Turner being one of those guys that came in, but was super athletic and super, you know, talent, super talented, had that God given ability. And that's the things that I like about Dallas Turner. I do see a guy that's a freak athlete, but another thing I see is a player that's extremely aggressive. And I think that that was one of the things that a guy in Vic Beasley even though I thought that Vic Beasley was a pretty good pro, I think one of the things that Vic Beasley lacked was he wasn't one of those guys that was extremely aggressive. And to be um, a guy, you know, to dominate the game, I really feel like one of the reasons why the Falcons didn't pay a guy in Vic Beasley is because he talked about, you know, wanting to do stuff outside of football. And I think that they just didn't see that dog in him that, mentality that kill or be killed type of mentality no pun intended but being one of those guys that just wants to dominate your opponent and if you look at um dallas turner one thing that i get off of him um is he's one of those guys that plays through the whistle so he's not a dirty player but he's a guy that's extremely extremely aggressive so i really don't feel like he's going to be a player that we got to worry about is he a passive type guy or is he a guy that's going to go 100 and 10 miles an hour at all times. And that's the, the vibes that I get off of a guy like Michael Parsons. If you go just look at his Penn State tape, go look at Michael Parsons and then go watch some Dallas Turner. To me, both of those guys give extreme effort. Both of those guys are freak athletes. And if you look at uh, Michael Parsons, even in the NFL, to me, he's still not the most technically sound guy, but he's had over 10 sacks every year since he's been in the league. So if you tell me that, Dallas Turner's floor is Michael Parsons like right now just as a freak athlete just a guy that's going to make plays he doesn't have all of the moves but he's just a guy that's going to run around and make plays I really feel like anybody you know that's an Atlanta Falcons fan if we could trade for 
uh, Michael Parsons, I don't think anybody would turn that down. I would take Michael Parsons in a heartbeat on this Atlanta Falcons team. And I actually recently had uh, one of the subscribers ask me under one of my videos, like, if we had a chance to trade our first round pick for Michael Parsons because there he's having, you know, contract talks with the Cowboys. I said I would do it in a heartbeat because I know what Michael Parsons is. So I don't got to even do no comparison. I know what Michael Parsons brings to the table. And Dre Murphy says, Jew, do you know if safety Justin Simmons still a free agent or not? Um, I think he still is a free agent. I think Justin Simmons is a free agent, but I think he's a free agent because he's uh, probably asking for too much money. Like he was one of those guys with the Broncos. At one point, he was the highest paid safety in the league. So I really feel like teams don't have the salary cap to sign him. And that's why I was seeing with the Falcons, everybody was mentioning Justin Simmons, Justin Simmons. I don't think it's a way that the Falcons will be able to afford Justin Simmons because we're paying Jesse Bates all of that money. So it's rare for a team to have two top flight safeties at the same time, unless you draft them together. That's the only way that could actually happen. Like when you seen Earl Thomas and you seen Cam Chancellor with the Seahawks, those guys were drafted and they were late picks. Like I think Cam Chancellor was like a third third or fourth round pick or something, third, fourth or fifth round pick. So they didn't know that Cam Chancellor was Cam Chancellor when they drafted him. He turned into an all pro safety. So us having two all pro safeties where you got them in free agency, that rarely happens. Like I doubt if you see any team that has a, a safety that's already making top dollar that they're going to be able to afford Justin Simmons. The only way that the Falcons could get Justin Simmons or any of these teams that are up the upper echelon teams, Justin Simmons is going to have to take a pay cut. Like he's going to have to come in and take a smaller deal than what he should based off his name and his reputation. He's going to look for big money. And I don't think that there's teams out there that can afford to give him that money unless it's one of those teams that's not paying another safety on their team already. And that was one of the reasons why Buffalo kind of got rid of their two safeties that they were paying. They had to let go of Jordan Poyer, I think they let go of Jordan Porter and Micah Hyde because they were paying both of those guys, you know, decent money. And let's see here. And Dre Murphy says, me personally, give me Jared Verse at eight because um, I like you said, um, bump moving back and end up losing the player you wanted to draft to another team by moving back uh, point blank period. Yeah. I agree with you. Like Jared versus one of those guys that I like as well. He was my favorite pass rusher in last year's draft. I think he was arguably the best pass rusher outside of Will Anderson, but I would take either one. I would take um Latu versus or Dallas Turner. And I've been flipping flopping those three guys, like their rankings. If my draft boy, it'd probably be one A, one B, and one C. Like all of those guys are, I don't know which one is going to be the top one off the board. But just me personally, I think that it's going to be Dallas Turner, not because he's the best, but I think he's the best fit for what the Falcons are trying to do with this three, four, where they're going to want uh, the end or the outside linebacker to drop in coverage and to be able to do a lot of different things. And at times I think you might see if we do go with Dallas Turner, him off the line of scrimmage, like, how the Cowboys used Michael Parsons in his first couple seasons where he was really playing linebacker. And at times in third and long situations, he would be, you know, you would be blitzing him. And I think that would be wise as much as that sound dumb. I think that would actually be wise to use Dallas Turner and move him around because you got guys like Caden Ellis that can rush the passer. So at times you can, you know, disguise who's in coverage, whether it's Dallas Turner dropping in the coverage whether it's Caden Ellis dropping in the coverage or Caden Ellis coming off the edge, whether it's uh, Troy Anderson who's coming back, coming off the edge. I really feel like having multiple guys that can do multiple things is never a bad thing. Can Dallas turn to be a pure pass rusher or pure defensive end? I think he can, but I don't think that that's how the Falcons are going to use him if they draft him. I think if they're looking to draft him, they're looking to draft him because of his versatility, not because he's just a, defensive end hand in the dirt never going to move going to stay on one side of the field at all times and line up with his hand in the dirt or in the two-point stance if you want a player that's just going to rush all day i say go with layatu latu because latu to me is the guy 
that's like a pure defensive end. He's not a guy that you're necessarily going to want to drop in the coverage. He's a guy that's going to strictly sit out there on the edge, play the run, play the pass. That's it. And that's what Miss Pam says. Me personally, I like Latu out of UCLA. Yeah, I like Latu a lot too. To me, Latu's the most polished, um, you know, most polished uh, pass rusher coming out of the draft. But I don't really know if, you know, he'll be, um, you know, he'll be who they pick because I don't know if that's what they're looking for. I really feel like they're looking for a player that has more versatility than just, um, you know, a guy that's going to strictly come off the edge and rush the passer. And Dre says, is Keanu Neal still a free agent? J-Rock said last night on AFN show uh, he would bring back Keanu hard-hitting Neal back <laughs> since he played under Raheem and knows the system. I think he is a free agent. He was with the Steelers, I believe, last year, but I believe they cut him or he was, he was a free agent. He was only like on a short deal with them. So the Falcons could bring Keanu Neal back, but if you bring Keanu Neal back, I think he has to be strictly – um strictly like a linebacker because at one point he played with the cowboys i think for a second too and they changed him to linebacker so i really feel like at this point i don't think that keanu neal after the injuries um uh, i don't think he has the lateral quickness anymore when he first came into the league i thought he was going to be a hall of famer because the year that he had as a rookie if he could have stayed on that trajectory and he didn't have those catastrophic you know knee injuries and stuff like that and it didn't affect his ability to move laterally, I think that he would have definitely been a Hall of Fame player. He had that type of talent. Like, he was like Cam Chancellor Part 2. He was one of them guys that would knock your head off, but also was lateral enough to make plays in the backfield as far as intercepting the ball and stuff like that. But now at this point, with all of the injuries that he's had to his, his knees and stuff like that and his lower extremities, he doesn't have the ability to move laterally like he once could. And that was the reason why the Falcons let him go he wasn't able to move you know laterally in coverage and stuff like that and like miss maggie said y'all hit that share button for your boy like share and subscribe i appreciate you guys and i'll put it down here let's see and let me scroll down a little bit and john tay rosier says what it do <laughs> what's going on bro i appreciate you joining me and if you just jumped in i'm just it's basically fan q a until 12 so we got like another good 17 minutes if you guys got questions drop your questions in the chat if you missed my whole matt ryan soliloquy you can go back and watch it after the show because i basically just start the show with talking about matt ryan being a future hall of famer and that is a no-brainer William, Amy, what's going on, man? I appreciate you joining me as well. If you got questions, like I said, go ahead and drop them questions in the chat. <laughs> he says Keanu Neal's washed up. I don't want to call him washed up, man. The man just had injuries. That's what it. That's what happens, man. Injuries are, you know, injuries get the best of us all. Once you once you had those, you know, those really catastrophic injuries, that could derail anybody's career. I don't care how athletic or how you know talented you are injuries have been the bugaboo for a lot of guys let's see here y'all drop y'all questions i'm trying to scroll through to see if i missed anybody's question let's see and outside of that i'll say this just outside of you know the pass rushing things of that nature as i mentioned for the falcons i think after pass rush I'll be looking at the secondary. I did a um, video about um, Kool-Aid McKinstry yesterday uh, out of Alabama. He's one of those guys that can cover really well, but not the best at, you know, his ball skills, not the best as far as intercepting the ball, but he's a extremely aggressive tackler, um, a guy that makes plays on the ball as far as gets a lot of PBUs, uh, pass breakups. Um, but if I were to gonna go corner, in the first round, it would be Terion Arnold out of Alabama because Terion Arnold is one of those guys that I think could be a special cornerback, a guy that has the skills, um, you know, to the ball skills to catch interceptions and take the ball away. A guy that was a former basketball player as well in high school, really good basketball player. So he just has a multitude of skills. 
Um, and I think that he just has the instincts that a lot of people, a lot of cornerbacks don't have. Um, and it's a lot of, you know, corners in this draft that I've been looking at recently, the kid out of Michigan um, that uh, Mike and K Styles talked about last night. Um, he's a guy similar, like they mentioned to Clark Phillips, physical at the point of attack, can tackle really well. And he actually is a pretty good at taking a ball away like Clark Phillips. He had a about five interceptions last year with uh, Michigan. So he's one of those guys I can see the Falcons going after. I'm a big fan of Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. And when you talk about somebody that's like A.J. Terrell clone, a guy that's pretty much to me reminds me of A.J. Terrell, that would be uh, Nate Wiggins. Nate Wiggins to me puts me in the mind. I don't know if because he played at Clemson, but he's a guy that's long, 6'2", big dude, long, rangy, you know, can make plays on the football, you know, it's physical, can make tackles and things of that nature. So if it came down to me picking one of these cornerbacks, personally, I think it would be out of Terry Arnold and Nate Wiggins. Those are the two guys that I really like. Um, if you're looking for like, a guy that's going to be like the number two corner to A.J. Terrell that can do a lot of different things, I think he probably, either Nate Wiggins or Terry Arnold would be the two guys that I really like. And William Amy says we need to grab an edge rusher first round and cornerback um, second round. Yeah, that's what I would do. If I were the Atlanta Falcons, I would go edge and then I would go corner. And if it were me, I might go edge and then edge again, depending on who's left on the on the table. Like if it's, um, you know, we take Latu, Verse, or Dallas Turner in the first round. In that second round, if a guy like Chop Robinson is still there from Penn State, I'm going to take Chop Robinson and I'll wait to the third round to get a corner because I really feel like the Falcons, to be honest with you guys, the Falcons are not terrible at corner. When I went back and looked at the roster and reassessed the roster, you have A.J. Terrell. You still have Mike Hughes. You have Clark Phillips, who you drafted last year. You have D. Alford. That's four corners right there. And those are four guys that are decent corners. So you don't necessarily have to go corner in the top two rounds. You could wait and find a gem. I believe we got Clark Phillips in like the fourth or fifth round. So there's going to be corners to be had. I want to get those guys in the trenches early. So if I can get one of those top three edge guys that I keep referring to, and then if I can go and get either another edge or even a, a defensive tackle, like if I can get a Byron Murphy in the second round from Texas, or to Vondre Sweat in the second round, I'm going to pair that up up front first and then look for my, you know, my cornerback. Because I feel like you can find corners at any point in the draft. As long as you're not looking for a number one corner. Now, if the Falcons are out there looking to replace A.J. Terrell, then you got to go in the first two rounds and you got to get one of these top guys. But if the Falcons' goal is just we need another cornerback just to compete at that number two, number three spot, then you can wait. But if you're trying to get somebody like that that's going to replace A.J. Terrell, then you're going to have to go in the top for the first two rounds because you're not going to – the chances of you finding uh, A.J. Terrell type first, you know, number one corner in the second or third or fourth round, you know, it's going to be harder after the first two rounds to probably find a number one cornerback. That's, that rarely happens. And Tony Tony Hall says, imagine the scheduling guys have us playing Pittsburgh uh, one week and facing Arthur Smith, Van Jefferson, Devontae Casey, uh, CP, Dan Quinn, Mariota, Dante Fowler, and Michael Walker the next week. It could happen that way. I mean, it's a lot of uh, a lot of games this year where we're going to have to face like former players that played with the Falcons. So. I'm not opposed to it because Dallas had a litter of our guys on their team because Dan Quinn was there. And now a lot of them have followed Dan Quinn to Washington with the commanders. So we're going to see a lot of our former players and hopefully they don't try to get back at us. I mean, I'm not too worried about it, but I can definitely see CP when we place the Steelers and Arthur Smith. They're definitely going to be trying to get back, trying to get get back at this point. Dan Quinn, I really don't think Dan Quinn is really holding any grudges against the Falcons because he had a lot of success when he was with our team. But Arthur Smith, I could definitely see him trying to get some get back because he got let go and he really didn't have any 
really much success when he was with the Falcons. So, and Dre Murphy says, me personally, I take Edge Rusher Jared Verse at uh, eight, and then second round take Nate Wiggins with the and then the uh, with the two third round picks, I'm taking Byron Murphy or Sweat, and with the other third round pick, I'm taking. Let's see. Wide receiver. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. I like how that's lining up. I don't know if Nate Wiggins will be there because I heard that Nate Wiggins could be a borderline first rounder. So that's the biggest concern that I have. Like with these corners, it's like if we don't take one in the first round and they're looking for a top corner, you can find some later in the draft. But I don't think they'll be the names that we're we've been hearing. Like the Quinion Mitchells, he's going to be a first rounder or a bottom first rounder. Or possibly a second round, an early second rounder. Nate Wiggins, a first rounder or a high second rounder. Um, any of the guys I named, Kool Aid McKinstry, a first rounder or an early second rounder. I don't see a lot of these guys dropping. Now, the Byron Murphys, I could see him going in the top three rounds as well. He could be a first rounder, second rounder, or third rounder. To Vondre Sweat, because of the um, drunk driving situation, I could see him possibly being like a dropping because I don't think he's going to, he's not going to get picked in the first round. He probably won't get picked in the second round. He'll probably be a third round pick because of what happened. And unless it's just a team that just really, really needs a, a one tech, like really needs a defensive tackle. But the only way I see that uh, Tavondre Sweat being drafted is if he goes to a team like the Titans that always take big defense alignment, the Eagles, because they always seem to draft defensive uh defensive talent in the first round no matter if they need it or not the pittsburgh steelers those are the teams you got to watch out for they always take defense alignment no matter what and let's see and beastly says i know we need an edge rusher i'm all down for that but if malik neighbors is there man that would be hard to pass at eight yeah, Malik Neighbors is he's crazy special, but I feel like it's a lot of guys that's crazy special in this draft, though, to be real with you. Like, if I'm the Falcons, to be honest, completely honest with you guys, if I were to go wide receiver, I'm going with Roma Dunze. That's just me personally. I always used to go with the big physical, you know, wide receiver over the shifty guy. So I was always the guy when they were comparing Julio to Antonio Brown or comparing Dez Bryant you know, to, or Megatron, Antonio Brown. At one point, they were comparing Julio, Antonio Brown, Megatron, Dez Bryant, and they were saying, like, who was the best out of those four or five guys? And I always say, I'm going with the bigger, faster, stronger guy because you can do more with him. AB is not beating a guy in the jump ball. I've seen Megatron where they put two, three guys on him, he still catch the ball. I've seen that game in Dallas where he basically took over the whole game he just told Matthew Stafford, throw the ball up, just put it near me. I'm going to come down with the ball. And with smaller wide receivers like a Malik Neighbors, yeah, he's shifty, but it's ways around getting, you know, it's ways around, you know, those guys that are shifty. When you're a big physical guy, it's harder to me personally to stop a guy that's big and shifty. And to me, that's a Roma Dunze or even like when Julio played. Julio was hard to stop because not only was he big, but he also was shifty. So he was big, fast, and shifty. So he could do it all. So it was like he could catch the jump ball. He could create separation with his routes. He could break tackles. He could do everything. He could block. And I feel like that's what a lot of people are not looking at with these smaller, shifty guys. Like, I love the Tyreek Hills. But to me, personally, Tyreek Hill will never be the best wide receiver in the NFL just for the point of he can't block like a bigger wide receiver, like a Julio. He can he can run routes and he can create separation, but he also can't catch the jump ball. So it's I've seen times where teams have been able to take Tyreek Hill out of the game because they're going to press him. They're going to do things to be more physical with him. And I feel like those bigger guys, it really was no way to stop a Julio. It was really no way to stop a Megatron. It was those bigger wide receivers that have speed and can run routes. To me, those are the toughest guys to stop because it's not really a way to you know, it's not really a way to stop them, especially in today's game. That's the reason why Mike Evans, for example, is one of those guys in Tampa that can run routes, that's big. 
he's not the most shifty, but he's shifty enough for his size where it's really not a way to stop him. The way that the rules are set up, and I feel like a guy like Mal Malik Neighbors, he's a really good talent, but he gives me the vibes of like Tyreek and those guys where he's shift uh, shifty, but what opposing defenses are going to try to do to him is be physical. They're going to say jam him at the line. Don't let him get that speed going. Don't let him accelerate. You're not going to be able to stop him because of today's rules, but you'll be able to be physical with him. And that won't work with a guy like Roma Dunze because he's just too big, too strong. You can be physical all you want to, but it ain't going to, it really ain't going to be a way to stop him because <laughs> he can run routes. He can, you know, high point the ball. And then he can also create separation with his route running. So if it came down to me, I'm going with one of those guys that are, bigger faster stronger that's just how i kind of always have rated it but if we did get malik neighbors he would be dangerous as well because you're pairing him with drake london that's big you're pairing him with uh kyle pitts that are already really really like big and strong so he kind of would be that yin to their yang but i think the falcons have already tried to do that when they went out and got rondell moore when they went out and got darnell mooney the reason they went to get those guys to pair with Drake London and to pair with Kyle Pitts because we already got physical, you know, wide receivers, guys that are really hard to stop and big, fast, and strong. So, but I like Malik Neighbors, but I don't think he's getting past one of those top teams. Like, I think the Giants is one of those teams that have their name has come up numerous times with possibly getting the Malik Neighbors. And I think a sleeper team would be the Arizona Cardinals. The Cardinals, for whatever reason, they like smaller wide receivers that are fast and quick, and that's why they had on their team a Rondell Moore. So they could be a team that also is sneaky, you know, looking at Malik neighbors. But it's a lot of good wide receivers in this draft. You mean you got the kid Parasol out of Florida that I really like. Um, it's um another kid that I was just watching tape on. I'm gonna do a video about him. He played at UCF and started at Alabama. I can't think of his name right now, but he was another guy that's really good. So it's wide receivers galore in this draft. You don't need to take a wide receiver at eight. It's too many, too many great players, and we see it too many uh, times in the last couple of years. The Pukas for the Rams, um, just all of these guys that you see every year come in, these running backs and these wide receivers, they come into the league and take the league by storm, and a lot of these guys are not first-round picks. And let's see. And there go Dre Murphy just said it. Wide receiver Ricky Parasol, and um, and then South Carolina, right? Xavier Leggett. Yeah, I forgot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, Leggett is another guy that nobody's really talking about, and he's a guy out of South Carolina I like a lot as well. And he probably might not be a first round pick because it's going to be so many other needs that teams have that some of these wide receivers are going to get pushed down the draft board. So hopefully Leggett, hopefully Ricky Parasol, hopefully those guys continue to drop so the Falcons can get them in like the second or third round. But really those guys, like especially Xavier Leggett, he's really a guy that has a first round draft trade from most of the prospects, but he hasn't, um, he probably won't be a first round pick depending on the quarterbacks that are drafted early, depending on, what the your team needs are some of these guys that should be first rounders are going to end up dropping let's see here. he said i missed a question let's we'll see here let me scroll up see miss pam's question <laughs> okay i don't see her question so miss pam drop your question in uh again because i missed your question <laughs> And what's going on, Trauma Locks? If you have a question, man, drop your question really quick in the chat, man. I appreciate you joining me because I'm going to be jumping off here uh, in a minute. But you can definitely catch me on uh, catch it on the playback. <laughs> and Dre Murphy says, Tony Hall, it's freaking time to show some love to the defensive side of the ball and go defense first round for a freaking change and not go offense four straight years. Right, exactly. That's my whole thing. It's like I love offense. I love putting up points. But at some point, you're going to have to stop somebody. And that's what happened in the 2016 
um, Super Bowl. That's what happened in the Super Bowl against the Patriots. It's like, yeah, everybody wants to blame Matt Ryan. Everybody wants to blame Kyle Shanahan. But let's be completely honest about this thing. The defense didn't do a whole lot to stop Tom Brady in that offense either. If we get one takeaway, one turnover, you know, that turns the game and flips it back in your favor. So at some point, I feel like this year the Falcons don't have a choice. I know what Raheem Morris and Terry Fontenot preaches about best player available. We got to go after, you know, the best player that's out there. But at this point, how I'm looking at this draft board, give me the, the best defensive player available. When I say best player available, I understand that. But at some point, there's always going to be a good wide receiver. Next year, there's going to be another wide receiver that everybody's going to want. So at some point, you got to start saying, let's narrow this down. Yes, it's best player available, but we have to start hitting on some of these needs on the defensive side of the ball. And we have to get some more game changers on the defensive side of the ball. If you look at the this Falcons team, there's enough game changers on offense. You got B. John Robinson, who's a game changer. You got Drake London, who's a game changer. You got Kyle Pitts, who's a game changer. Now you got Kirk Cousins, who's a really good uh, distributor of the football. When I look on the defensive side of the ball, outside of Grady Jarrett, outside of David Onyemata, which those guys are really like three techs or nose tackles, what game changers do you have? You got A.J. Terrell, who's a solid corner, but he's not a guy that's been taking the football away consistently. You got Jesse Bates, who to me, out of all of the guys, he's the only guy outside of Grady Jarrett and Onyemata that I can consistently say last year there really wasn't a game where I was like Jesse Bates is getting exposed like he was the guy that was the game changer for us he was the x factor on the defense but outside of Jesse Bates you really didn't have anybody that was a game changer last year so that's why I say you have to go out and get somebody yes you had um AK who had some you know he had a couple splashes here and there you had Bud Dupree who gave you a couple splash plays. You had Calais Campbell who gave you a couple splash plays. But outside of those guys, you didn't have anybody consistently that when the team pulls up the film and they get in the film room going into that week to play the Falcons, you don't really have them saying this is public enemy number one. Outside of, you know, Jesse Bates, I really don't feel like there was anybody that they were really afraid of because Grady got hurt. But when Grady's out there, Grady, Onyemata, and Jesse Bates, and AJ. Those are the guys that I'm looking at on film. Like, we got to watch out for these guys. But I feel like we need another guy where you know them by that one name. Like, Grady, you know, okay, Grady, he's special. Jesse Bates, he's special. But we need a guy that when we talk about the TJ Watts, we talk about the Micah Parsons, we talk about uh, the Daniil Hunters, we talk about the premium guys when we talk about the Aaron Donalds. I feel like the Falcons need one of those guys. And that's why I want them to go defense and possibly somebody in the front seven that can be a game changer. We need a Max Crosby. We need one of these guys where opposing teams know week in and week out, I'm guaranteed that one of these guys is going to give me uh create a negative play for the offense. They're going to get a strip sack. They're going to get an interception guaranteed. Like they're going to come into the game and change the game. And that's what made, um, the LTs, when we talk about Lawrence Taylor, when we talk about Ray Lewis, when you talk about Brian Erlacher, um, you talk about Troy Palomalu, you talk about Ed Reed, these were guys that you knew at some point in the game, they're going to make a play. I don't know when it's going to happen, but at some point in this game, they're going to change the, the flow of this game. They're going to turn the game in our favor. And I need more of those type of players on defense. I really feel like the Falcons currently don't have anybody really necessarily that teams are really really afraid of we have guys like i said we got grady i don't want to disrespect grady grady is a guy that's that shows up on film but grady needs another player on the defensive line that's going to take pressure off of him like people forget the year that aaron donald won the super bowl yes he was great he was aaron donald he's he gets 10 sacks a season over double digit sacks but people forget that he had von miller who's going into the hall of fame on that team he had guys um, and Leonard Floyd that was on that team. He had Jalen Ramsey on the back end. That'll be a Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer. So you got to have multiple guys. You can't just have one guy and think that that's going to be enough. You got to have multiple guys that's going to take pressure off of that main guy. And Grady hasn't had consistently another guy on the defensive line or in the front seven that can consistently take that pressure off of him. 
where he can go in and make a, you know, go in and and make make plays. He always has to deal with double teams and triple teams and teams always focusing on him. We've literally seen Grady Jarrett being blocked by three and four guys, which is ridiculous. <laughs> and Miss Pam, I thank you for dropping your question again. So she says, what is your late round gem for our Falcons team? That's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. I seen a, a a player, and he played with the I believe the Miami Hurricanes. I think he's a I think he's like a safety. He's like a a safety slash um like a box line a box safety type player. I think his name is last name is Williams. I think he could be a guy that could be a steal if the Falcons want to take a player that's just like a hybrid safety linebacker type um i'm gonna look his name up really quick i think it's like i don't know if it's mike williams but it's a player that i've seen and he's one of those guys where i was like yeah he's a playmaker i think he would be um let me look it up really quick i'm glad you asked that question let's see but he's definitely one of those guys that i think that Let's see. And you gotta go look, you gotta go look at some of his um his highlights. Let's see. Okay, I think his name is James Williams. James Williams is his name, I believe. Let's see. But when I seen his his highlights. I was impressed with with what he could do. I think he could be like a a good fit with the Falcons if the Falcons decide that they want to take a guy that's like a hybrid guy that is not an every down guy. Okay, so this guy is 6'5", 224 pounds. James Williams is the guy that I would say is a sleeper for the Atlanta Falcons. If they want to get a guy that can do some of everything, you want a Cam Chancellor type, but a guy who can also make plays on the football, I think I, I really like uh, James Williams a lot. He's one of those guys that I definitely think that the Falcons, he could be a late round type gym that nobody really, you know, looking at. So I like his game a lot. And maybe I'll do a, um, a, a prospect video on him, but he's a gym that I would, I would say, um, Miss Pam, go look at James Williams. I like his, I like his game. When I looked at some of his highlights and his, his film from Miami, he was just a guy that was always making plays, always around the football. And that's what I feel like the Falcons need. We need guys kind of like a Nate Lambin last year and Jesse Bates, where how many times last year did we see Jesse Bates punch the ball out? Um, you see Nate Lambin punch the ball out and get the ball back to the, the offense. Those are the type of plays, as I always say, that there's three to four plays in a game that's going to change the game and, you know, flip the you know, the uh, momentum back in your team's favor. That's what the Falcons need. We need more guys that makes heads up, sound, makes a play. You know, we need the ball back. They go out there and say, I'm going to find a way to rip the ball away from the, the opposing offensive player and get the ball back to the offense to make a play. And let's see. And says you also miss Xavier Litt Littens. Okay, so Xavier, drop your uh your question real quick. That'll be like one of the I'll take two more questions. But Xavier, drop your uh Xavier Linton, drop your question. Cause I don't know where it is in the chat. I ain't gonna be able to find your question. <laughs> if you're still in here, drop your question. And I seen somebody ask about basketball too. Let's go. Let's see who this is. Let's see. Uh, Dre Murphy's talking to Corey Gear in the in the chat. He says, "What do you think about the Clippers playing the Dallas Mavericks first round, though, bro?" Oh yeah, that's gonna this I'm this gonna be very interesting NBA playoffs. I'll say that. I think the Dallas might get the Clippers on that in that first round. Kyrie and Luka Doncic right now are playing on another level. For whatever reason, Ka Kawhi Leonard can never stay healthy and Paul George, those two guys, for whatever reason, the Clippers can never put it together. They got all the talent in the world, but for whatever reason, they just haven't been able to put it together, even though they got James Harden now, too. So 
But I think that the Dallas Mavericks right now are just a more cohesive team. And the way that uh, Uncle Drew, a.k.a. Uh, I, um, Kyrie Irving is playing right now, he's playing on another level. Xavier Littman says, what are your thoughts on pot uh, potential trench players we can target to solidify the pass pro? Uh, and is this just, are you referring to the offensive line or the defensive line? Because it sounds like you're talking about the offensive line. If you're talking about the offensive line, to be honest with you, uh, Xavier, I haven't really did a lot of like work on looking at the offensive linemen. Just for the mere fact that I feel like our offensive line is solidified. Like we have one of the better offensive lines in the game. I do think the Falcons are going to probably draft an offensive lineman, but I don't think that none of the guys that we will draft will be the starting, like starting this season. I really feel like the starting five from last year is going to be the same for this year. I think um Dalman at center, Bergeron at guard. Lindstrom at guard, McGarry at right tackle, Jake Matthews at left tackle. That's going to be your offensive line starting the season, barring injury. So let's knock on some wood because, you know, I hate talking about injuries, but if an injury happens, that's when you might see, you know, somebody end up getting in and playing. So Falcons probably will draft another center because we lost Matt Hennessy, even though they still got Ryan Newsel. So maybe the Falcons will look at drafting a guard, a guy who can play guard and center. I think the Falcons will take a guy that can play guard and center and then possibly bring in a guy that can play uh, the swing tackle position because we signed Storm uh, Norton, I think, to like another, like a one-year deal, but you're still going to need a guy in the future. If you decide not to bring Storm Norton back next year, like the year after this season, you still probably want to go after a tackle. So they probably look for a swing tackle and a guy that can play guard and center. But as far as the offensive line and drafting, I don't think the Falcons are going to take an offensive lineman early in the draft unless they know, you know, something that we don't know about Jake Matthews. Like Jake Matthews is looking at possibly retiring within the next couple of years. Then if we see them draft the offensive lineman early, then that means that maybe they know something we don't know. <laughs> And I, let's see here. I see another question here. So I'm going to take these. Let's see. I'll take these last two questions and then that'll be it. So Beastly says, I know this is about Falcons, but who do you think the Hawks are going to trade this offseason, Trey or Murray? I would keep Trey Young, period. Um, So whoever else they want to trade, and I'm a actually a Cavs fan. I'm a Cleveland Cavs fan just because I started off a LeBron fan and I stuck with the team similar to what I did with Michael Vick with the Falcons. So I think with it, when it comes to the Hawks, I say Trey, Trey doesn't get the respect he deserves. Ice Trey is one of those guys that I have a lot of respect for. I actually wanted the Cavs to draft Trey Young. Uh, we drafted Colin Sexton instead, which Colin Sexton was a really good player as well. But I thought that Trey Young was a better all around talent as far as a pure point guard like can shoot the ball but can also get assists and stuff like that and i really feel like whatever the, the hawks do if they're going to trade trey young they better get a haul for him like get a bunch of draft picks but if they can keep trey young i would keep trey young i think trey young is a special talent i think he's one of those guys that doesn't get the respect that he deserves just for the mere fact that he's similar to steph curry like everything revolves around him he controls the tempo of the game when he's out there on the floor so i really feel like trey is the better player between the two i would take trey young i wouldn't trade trey young if i were the, the hawks i would keep trey young i don't think that he's really the problem with the, the atlanta hawks so if if you guys you know are thinking about trading him then i think the Cavs should be looking at um if we well if we didn't have Darius garland and i said we would think we should look at trying to get trey young but Trey's not the the Hawks problem. He's the first thing from you guys' problem. I really think that the Hawks, y'all need one more wing score. What the Hawks are missing is a wing score. A guy that can, similar to like a, I'll say similar to like an Anthony Edwards. Like I feel like y'all need like a, a guard that's like six 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 seven, but that can score consistently and can guard one through three. 
Because I really feel like you guys haven't really had a guard that can score, but that's like a wing defender that can do it all pretty much. You guys need that T-Mac or that, that guy that can put the ball on the floor that can create. Because really right now, Trey Young is like, he's the offense. He controls the whole offense. So I really feel like y'all need a guy that can get his own offense, which you guys try to do with uh, Murray. I like Murray as well. Murray is not a bad player as well. The the thing about Murray, I think that is kind of hurting the Hawks is he's not a guy that plays off the ball really well. And that's why I feel like it's a problem with a lot of these guys that plays on these teams, similar to even the Cavs. Um, our problem is you too many of these guards are ball dominant. We got uh, Darius Garland that needs the ball, and we got uh, Donovan Mitchell, a guy that needs the ball. So a lot of the, the problem with these these teams nowadays is when it comes to the guards, they don't know how to move without the, the basketball. And I think that's what makes Golden State special is they have um, Steph Curry and they have Klay Thompson. But what made the Warriors great is Klay can move without the ball and run off screens and get open and shoot. And um, you see Steph Curry is the same way. He can run off of screens. He don't have to dominate the basketball, hold the basketball. He can distribute, but he also can score without having the ball in his hands. And I feel like that's kind of what makes this newer generation, the newer NBA, what it makes it hard is it's a lot of your turn, my turn type basketball, where it's one on one. And that's the thing that the Mavericks do. If you watch the Mavericks play, you don't see them move without the ball a lot. Luka Doncic needs the ball in his hands when he scores the ball, and then they come back down the court, they give Kyrie the ball, and he isolates and do his thing. So it's not a lot of cohesion where one guy's moving without the ball, cutting to the basket where I can pass it to you, get an easy backdoor layup. Everything is one-on-one. -on -one. That's just the world that we live in. That's just the new NBA. It's everything is kind of like isolation, Whoever, and that's why it comes down to who has – more stars usually what makes the denver nuggets great and what made as i mentioned the golden state warriors great is they actually play as a unit when you have a team that can play as a unit and can pass the ball this the san antonio spurs was another team when they had tim duncan and those guys what made their team great was they didn't have a lot of great individual players necessarily tim duncan could do his thing and they had guys that could go off the dribble like tony parker and like manager nobly but what made those guys great is they played as a team. So I really feel like that's the problem with a lot of in today's NBA It's a lot of one on one. And it comes from the AU, you know, and stuff like that, where everything is one on one isolation, pick and roll. But everything is I need the ball in my hands. I can't be effective if I don't have a ball in my hands. I'm sitting in the corner, you know, waiting to shoot a three. So somebody's draw, driving the ball and kicking the ball. But it's nobody setting a back screen for somebody to, you know, backdoor alley you backdoor layup you don't see a lot of that kind of stuff you don't really see a lot of play calls in today's nba everything is one-on-one -on -one, isolation one-on-one -on -one. and usually if you watch it it's a lot of switching on defense and that's what i really feel like is hurting the hawks because a lot of the times teams will run a screen and roll and then they'll set a screen on whoever's uh guarding uh, Trey Young and they make Trey Young play defense on whoever that person is that's trying to isolate and we know that Trey Young is not the biggest guy so I really feel like that's the issue with today's NBA same thing that goes with the Cavs we were really small with Darius Garland and and Colin Sexton and that's the reason they traded him but that was the issue we ran into guys can't play one-on-one -on -one defense nowadays and now because guys don't fight through screens or fight over screens they allow teams to create the matchups they want by doing this. We're going to switch everything on defense, which ends up being LeBron versus a smaller player or, you know, your best score against our weakest defender. So with that being said, uh, that's just my take on, you know, the, the NBA and my take on the Atlanta Hawks. Personally, I would keep Trey Young, but I would pair him with somebody that's a better defender and a, a, a pure score, but a score that doesn't need the basketball. So somebody like a Rip Hamilton that can just run off screens or Reggie Miller. I can run off screens and get open. I can shoot shots or even to a lesser, de a lesser degree, because at this point he's, um, you know, had injuries. But if Clay Thompson somehow was on the trading block or becomes a free agent, I feel like he would be like a perfect fit with like a, the Atlanta Hawks. 
because Clay Thompson is a guy that plays defense. And then he's also a guy that can, you know, he can actually guard players, but he don't need to necessarily need the basketball to get his 20 points. He can get it off of just running off screens or, you know, shooting threes and things of that nature. But with that being said, this being your boy, Jew, I have a lot more content coming for you guys. Um, definitely hit that like, hit that subscribe button, share out this content. Um, as you guys know, uh, tonight, I think, starts the playing game. So you guys, um, you know, you guys enjoy the playoff, the playoff, the NBA playoffs getting ready to start this weekend. Uh, my Cavs will be taking on the Orlando Magic. So I'm excited about that. Um, I believe the Hawks are in the play in tournament. So you guys enjoy this, NF, you know, NBA basketball. And next week we'll have the NFL draft is fastly approaching. So with that being said, this being your boy, Ju. I'll holler at you guys in our next video. Um, with that being said, y'all have a blessed week. Peace.